Hello again, welcome back. This is part two of the lesson on regression for S1 and AS maths. Um, and now this is the more important part really. Um, you've got a little handout to complete with this for your notes. There's just one side to it, although you'll need to write on the back for example two, or maybe write on a separate piece of paper. Um, but the key thing here is that we're going to look at, we'll do an example of finding the regression line, one more example, but it's more about how do you interpret that, how can you interpret that, um, and uh, what, what do you do with it basically. Um, so to start with we're just going to look at um, the difference between interpolation and extrapolation. Um, you may have heard of these words before, well you know interpolation um, from doing linear interpolation and hopefully you'll see the link as we go through and do this. Um, but if we take a look at this example here we've got um, a relationship, it looks like a positive correlation between the length of treatment and loss in weight. So maybe this is a trial for a weight loss drug. Um, let's put a straight line in there. There we go. Um, now note that I've done, um, I've drawn the line and I've extended it up here beyond the end of my data and down this way. And if you do linear regression it gives you the equation of a line and of course the equation of a line extends indefinitely in all directions um, but the key thing here is to examine how we can use that line and when can we rely on it to make predictions so for example if we wanted to uh, make a prediction for someone who uh, had the treatment for this amount of time we would well we'd extrapolate we'd interpolate using the graph we'd read up okay using a ruler if you're doing it from the graph and across and this would be our prediction for their loss in weight okay so you can do that from the graph alternatively you've got an equation for this graph if you've done regression so you can substitute this value into the equation and out will pop this value and that's your prediction for their weight loss and that is interpolation and there's a little explanation of it here estimating values from the line of best fit which is what I've just drawn or from the regression line i.e. using the equation within the range of the data so this value length of treatment that I used was less than the largest value that had been in my data and it's more than the smallest value it's within the range and I can do that I can do that fairly reliably and the stronger the correlation the more reliably I can do that um, Alternatively, we have extrapolation. So let's say I wanted to predict um, what would happen for a very long period of treatment. Okay, so I go up to my graph here and across, I should have used the ruler thing, never mind, um, and that would be my prediction for the weight loss for somebody who's had this amount of time on the treatment. And that's called extrapolation because I'm, I'm going beyond the sort of the bounds of my data up here. I never actually had any data about treatments this long or weight loss this great. So really my data here is not reliable. It might be about right but we just don't know and that's the point so we can't rely on that. So extrapolation is when you do the same thing but you're outside the range of the data that you started with. And we don't like that because it means that it is unreliable. And it's a choice sort of one mark question or two mark question in the exam um, for you to comment on that. And you would just say, well, you can't really use that to make predictions. It's unreliable. Uh, so let's have a look at an example here. We've got an experiment. Um, in fact, this was the one that we saw in part one. We did the regression line for this, comparing the length of the extension on a spring with uh, the mass placed on it and uh, you'll recall we got this relationship here okay so it was a positive correlation um, and the value of y so the extension increases as x increases so a couple of things to find out here we want to find out the value of y the length um, when the mass is 35 and the same thing when the mass is 120. So this linear regression line effectively becomes a formula. So A part 1, we simply use that formula. So Y is 43.89 plus 
0 0.2305 times x, which in this case is 35. And I did that just now, it comes to 51.96 centimeters. So that's our prediction for what the, uh, what the length of the spring would be um, if we placed a mass of 35 kilograms on it. Do the same thing now for a mass of 120 kilograms. So very similar, 43.89 plus 0 0.2305 times 120 and that comes to 71.55 centimeters. Okay now which is the more reliable estimate? <clears throat> well if we look at the data that we've got here we did an experiment and the masses range from 20 up to 100 kilograms so a mass of 35 kilograms falls nicely within that range about here so that would be interpolation and that's allowed, that's fairly reliable depending on the strength of your correlation. 120 kilograms though, that's up here and we never tested data up there. We don't know, the spring might break up there or the, its behaviour might change. So, this is the most reliable, um, uh, most reliable estimate. Now for B, we're asked to explain what these two constants mean in this context. So 43.89, that's my first value here, that's the constant that's not changing and that's effectively my y axis intercept. Okay, if we do some crude axes here, x and y, if we have a graph looking something like this, then this is my intercept here. So that tells me that when x is 0, my y value, so the length of my spring, is going to be this value here. It's going to be 43.89. So 43.89 is the length of, this, of the um, spring when it's not stretched, so when there's no mass on it. So I'll just note that. So it's the length of the spring with no load. So effectively that's the natural length. And then what about this, the 0.2305x? Um, so 0 0.2305, that's the gradient. the gradient of my line isn't it and so that means that for every one unit we go along the x-axis so if we go along by one then we're going up by 0 0.2305 okay and thinking about the units um, x is in kilograms and 0 0.2305 that's an increase of 0 0.2305 centimeters for every one kilogram increase. So I can say it's the increase in length when one kilogram is added. So every kilogram we add the length will increase by 0 0.2305 centimeters. So, just put the increase in length in centimetres. So, the numbers have meaning and you will be asked to interpret them. Um, that's how to interpret them in this example. Alright, final example um, for, for the regression chapter. Example 2 on this sheet. Um, have a read of this. Maybe pause and have a read through. Um, we're dealing with uh, an experiment. Um, supplements, food supplements given to hens to adjust the hardness of their shells and they've found some way of measuring the hardness okay I've got any units there because it's a bit tenuous but they've measured the hardness and these are the values and that depended on the food supplement given so uh, the hen or hens that were given um, two grams per day of the supplement 
their uh, shell hardness was measured as 3.2 and so on. <clears throat> so this is the data that they got and I imagine they were hoping that the more supplement they gave the harder the shells would be and they wanted to quantify that. And you can see here that obviously increasing the value here, increasing the amount of food supplement given, you can see there there is an increasing trend. So there's going to be some sort of positive correlation here um, and we're looking for the linear relationship. But um, there's actually a mistake here and this is my fault. I copied this from, the, from um, uh, took this question from a textbook and um, well they've suggested that we find the regression line of F on H and if we think about that that suggests that we want to have F equals A plus B H and really that's the sort of setup that you would have if H was the um, independent variable so H was the thing that you were changing and F was the dependent variable, or the response variable. Um, but here, we can see that actually f is the thing that we're setting independently. That's effectively our x-axis, because we're changing that, and we want to see how h responds. So what we want is not f on h, we want h on f. Okay, so we don't want this. In fact, let's get rid of it. Because what, because what we want is um, something along the lines of H equals A plus B times, uh, oops, get rid of that, H equals, try again, A plus B lots of F. So how does H depend on F? Um, so to work that out, I'm just going to take you back to a previous page to look at the formula. So this is a page from um, part one, and if you look at the way it is, um, for the line of y on x, so the line that's y equals something, the formula here, this is the way to remember it, it has x, y on the top, and it always has the two variables here, so x, y, or y, x, it doesn't matter. Um, but the one on the bottom is always the second one, so if it's y on x, then it's on top of x, x, so x, x goes on the bottom because we would have a choice here between whether we had um, in this case we could have FF on the bottom or HH on the bottom and having the right one um, on the bottom in that formula determines whether your answer is meaningful or not whether you calculate the right thing um, so this is going to be the regression line of F of H on F so we need SFF to go on the bottom. So let's go ahead and work these out. Um, we've got a whole bunch of data here and it transpires that they probably meant H on F anyway because they've given us what we need to work that out but not uh, for F on H. So we need to work out S um, H F. So if we do that that's going to be equal to Sigma H F minus Sigma H Sigma F over n, which is sigma hf, well that's the same as sigma fh, 422.6 minus sigma h, so that's 45.8 times sigma f, which is 56, divided by the number of data values we had, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let me just work that out. And incidentally, um, because your calculators are clever and they know bid mass, you can just type this in as is. So I just typed in 422.6 minus 45.8 times 56 divided by 7, exactly as I said it. Um, and it gives me the answer, which is 56.2. Okay, that's SHF. Now we said that because it's the line, the regression line of H on F, the one we want for the bottom of our formula is S. F, F. Okay, so that's going to be sigma F squared minus sigma F in brackets squared over N. And I've got that here, that's 560 minus sigma F, where are we? Uh, sigma F is 56, so 56 squared divided by 
seven. And that, let's just work it out, 560 minus 56 squared divided by seven equals 112. So straight away, both these numbers are positive. So that tells me that my gradient is going to be positive. I have a positive correlation, and that's what I expected. Um, but let's just work out what B is. So B is equal to S H F divided by S F F. Um, so that's 56.2 uh, divided by 112, and that gives me 56.2 divided by ants. I write it as a fraction. Oh, it's a long fraction, a uh, long decimal here. 0 0.501785, and it goes on. But six significant figures is tons because I'm not going to keep all of those. But that's I want them all for now. Okay. Okay. So bringing that forward uh, to just a new page, give me a bit of space. Um, we need to work out a now. Um, so effectively the intercept on my, uh, well not the y-axis, what axis is it? On the h-axis, the hardest axis. So to do that I need to use the formula, but I've got to make sure I get it the right way round. Um, so I'll take you back to that page again. And this is in your formula book. Um, but when we're finding the regression line of y on x, then the formula for a is y-bar minus b times x-bar. So it's y equals that we're getting, and we have y first in this formula. So we're working out h equals, um, the regression line of h on f. So we're going to do a is h bar minus b times f bar. So here we go. Oh, that's not it. Try again with a pen. So uh, a is equal to, we said h bar minus b times f bar and thankfully h bar and f bar are all done for us uh, 6.543 is h bar minus b that we've just worked out so 0 0.501785 blah 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 effectively we're going to use the ants button on our calculators times f bar which is 8 from up here so we just use these two values and if we work that out, let's do that quickly, 6.543 minus ants times 8. That gives me 2.5287 and a few more, 2.5287, dot, 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 dot. Um, so I've got my A and B. Um, I'm not doing any coding. I don't need to transform these. So this is my... This is going to give me my regression line. So I'm going to round these now, um, and we'll go with three significant figures. That would seem sensible. So um, my equation is h is equal to a, which is 2.53, if we round it to three significant figures, plus b, lots of f, so plus 0 0.50. And we're rounding this so it's 502 lots of F. That's my relationship. And to illustrate that just with a sort of a sketch, the relationship is a linear one, the intercept is up here at 2.53, and the gradient is roughly a half. So this is F, this is the amount of supplement given, and this is H, the hardness of the shell, so that's 2.53. 5, 3, and we know the gradient is roughly a half. Now, the next part of the question, if we go back, is asking uh, to interpret what the values of A and B tell you. So a bit like we were asked just now. So if we answer that now, um, so A, well, A is the H-intercept. Okay, this is A up here. And this tells me what the hardness of the shell is when the food supplement is zero. Okay, so that's the natural shell hardness. Um, so 
that's our answer. It's the natural shell hardness or the shell hardness when there is no supplement given. So that's what I'll put. Oh dear, my handwriting is deteriorating. I apologise for that. Okay, so no supplement, we get 2.53 hardnesses. We don't know what those units are. Um, B is a gradient. Oops, don't need that. Uh, so B is the gradient. So it tells me how much my hardness is increasing as I increase the food supplement. Um, and we'll just take a look at the units. Go back to our table. The food supplement is in grams per day and the hardness, well, we don't know. <coughs> um, so we'll refer back to the units here. So for an increase of one gram per day, um, if we go and increase by one gram, then the increase in hardness would be 0 0.502. So if that's 0 0.502, and that's an increase of one gram. So we would describe it as the increase in hardness for a one gram increase in the food supplement. And finally we're asked to explain why we shouldn't try to calculate the shell hardness for a soup food supplement of 20 grams. Well, that would be extrapolation. Okay, 20 grams is somewhere up here. It's well outside of the data. You know, we've tested food supplements from 2 grams a day up to 14 grams a day. Nowhere near 20. So it would be rather foolish to expect that to be a good prediction. Um, so in terms of what to write, we can say uh, for C, 20 grams, but it lies well outside the range of data. And so it would be extrapolation. So it would be unreliable. We just don't know whether this straight line, this linear relationship, carries on up here or not. Um, so that brings us to the end of part two, and therefore to the end of our lesson on regression. Um, if you feel like giving me some feedback, I'd really, really appreciate it. You can leave some comments um, on YouTube. Always you can come and find me in school as well, talk to me like a human being. But if you leave comments on YouTube, maybe some other clever person in the class will reply, um, and uh, you get a bit of dialogue going. If you've got a question, they might reply to that too, or if not, you can put a question about the subject material and I'll try and answer that. Um, but because I haven't been doing these videos for very long, I'd really like to know what you think, how they could be improved, anything you like about them, anything you don't like. So I'd love to have your comments, whatever they happen to be. See you next time.